Welcome to episode 187 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing writer Michael Lucker. He's been working as a writer for decades and has written many animated films, including Spirit, Stallion of the Cinemaron, and Muon 2. He has a great story about arriving in Hollywood and working for Steven Spielberg and how he got Spielberg to read one of his scripts. So stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. A couple of quick notes. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 187. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents and managers and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Again, if you'd like to check that free guide out, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. I talk about my writers group quite often on the podcast. We're looking to add a couple of good writers to the rota rotation. We meet every Tuesday at 7.15 p.m. until about 10 p.m. in Sherman Oaks, California. Member writers put up about 25 pages every five weeks. The pages are read by professional actors in front of the other writers in the group. And then the listening writers give notes to the writers who are presenting pages that night. It's a great way to workshop your material, network with other talented actors and writers, and hone your critical thinking skills by giving the other writers notes on their material. I found it immensely helpful in developing my own scripts. This is a live in-person event. So if you need, so you do need to live somewhere near Sherman Oaks, California to be able to attend weekly. If you're not in the LA area, consider maybe starting a writer's group of your own. Nearly every city in the world has a community of filmmakers and writers. And in most cases, they're just looking for someone to step up and be a later leader and get things organized. The one big stumbling block for people is with this writers group is that you have to be committed to showing up nearly every Tuesday, even when you're not presenting pages. That way you can give notes to the other writers. It's a very symbiotic relationship. When you put your pages up, the other writers give you notes. And then when they put up pages, you give them notes. So, you know, you're only up presenting pages once every five weeks, but you still need to be there almost every single Tuesday just to be a part of this group and participate and give feedback to the other writers. If you'd like to learn more about the group, go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash writers group. That's all one word. It's just writers group. Um, just all one word tacked on to the end of sellingyourscreenplay.com. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash writers group. I will, of course, link to it in the show notes as well. So now let's get into the main segment. Today, I'm interviewing writer, director, Michael Lucker. Here is the interview. Welcome, Michael, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Hey, thanks for having me. So to start out, maybe you can just give us a quick overview of your background. Where did you grow up and how did you um, get into the entertainment industry? Sure, I grew up in Atlanta and uh, started writing songs for girls I had crushes on that wouldn't give me the time of day. And, <laughs> and I started writing articles in the school paper and I uh, wrote a play in high school and then went off to college in Boston and studied uh, broadcasting and film at Boston University. And then I moved out to LA like uh, within uh, a couple months after graduation and landed penniless and broke, you know, uh, in, uh, in Pasadena. And um, I uh, started sending out resumes, and then my career kind of took a winding, you know, a winding, weaving trail from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a couple things to dig in there. Um, why did you end up in Pasadena? Did you have a friend there or some connection? Why did you choose Pasadena as an area? <laughs> yeah, I uh, wasn't planning on it. It's just the only couch I had to land on when I got there. It was a buddy of mine from college who had an uncle that lived there, and uh, 
my buddy got the guest room and I got the couch. And that's um, the first spot where I where I started, really. Yeah. And then there I just started uh, trying to uh, get word out and get my foot in the door anywhere I could. And so let's talk about some of those specific steps. What exactly did you do? Um, did you have a bunch of scripts that you wrote in college so you already had some material to start sending out? Well, I uh, actually was just trying to get a job in production so I could get off you know, the couch and get my own place. And I went to the Samuel French bookstore on Ventura Boulevard, and I found a book there called The Hollywood Creative Directory. And in it, it had uh, the emails and names or addresses of everybody in, in L.A. that I wanted to work for. So I promised myself that um, I would send 100 letters to everybody I wanted to to, 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 to work for. And, um, of those hundred, I got one interview and it was a Steven Spielberg's company. And, uh, I got hired, uh, by them and, uh, to work at Amblin Entertainment as a PA when I was 21. And, uh, within my being there two weeks, they asked me if I wanted to be Steven's assistant hmm. because his assistant was leading and they thought I'd be good for the job. So I said yes, and I took it, and I started on uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade um, as uh, Steven's PA and, and had a chance to work for him for a year and a half on other movies. Okay. Did you know out of college that you wanted to write as opposed to direct or act or, or you know, any produce or something like that? Like you in the back of your mind, you knew writing was going to be your focus? I did. I had aspirations to direct and produce as well, and I've been fortunate to do a little bit of both, but I always knew that writing was my be my bread and butter. I loved writing growing up, and I loved writing in college, and writing my first screenplay um, in college was one of the most fun things I'd ever done. So when I landed in L.A., I was trying to find the job to pay my bills and pay for my macaroni and cheese, but at the same time, I was also trying to uh, type at night so I can get a script. Uh, you know, sold and, and try and get an agent and get on my way. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about that. How many scripts did you arrive in L.A. with, just to get a feel for what your <laughs> background was? I had one script. Okay. I had one script. It was called Insecurity, two words. And it was about two guys getting out of college, getting recruited by the FBI, only to find out that they'd been set up as fall guys. And they had to get themselves out of that. And uh, it didn't get me a lot. Steven was kind enough to read it. And I remember him reading it and saying, this is much more violent than I thought you were capable of because he thought I was a nice, sweet boy from Georgia, which, of course, I was, am. But I tend to write with a little bit of edge and attitude in my, in my action writing. So okay. um, that was the first script. And then from there, I got an opportunity to write uh, another one called Repeat Offender, and I just kept cranking out scripts for years after that, and people kept reading them. Okay, so let me just talk a little bit about that relationship with Steven Spielberg. Um, I think it's it's not that uncommon for someone to land in L.A. and get that assistant job, but maybe you can talk about sort of the protocol of, you know, being professional and appropriate and not putting your boss in an awkward situation where, hey, man, I got this script. Um, how did you approach him? How many weeks or years or months did you work for him before you started to broach that subject of hey would you read my script or maybe just talk about that a little bit because I think that's something that you know potentially a lot of writers could run into sure it's a great question uh, there is certainly uh, you know a protocol and um, a way that you should handle yourself when you're in those environments if you get those opportunities and act with a little bit of uh, class and operate with a little bit of integrity. So I did that and I worked my ass off for him, you know, 12, 14 hour days, uh, five, six days a week for well, about a year and a half. But uh, during that time, I was trying to write at night after I was done with my work, after I was done with my 12 hour days and everybody go home, I would type and oftentimes I would type um, uh, on the computer at Amblin because I didn't have enough money for my own computer when I started. And uh, soon um, people started asking me what I was up to. And I told them and um, a couple people at the, uh, the office said, hey, have you um, uh, shared it with Stephen? And I said, no, I didn't really know or feel like that was appropriate. And then I think one of the senior development executives told him I was writing a script. And um, and then he asked me about it. And of course, I was happy to share it with him. Yeah, yeah. Now, was there any reservations? One of the big things you hear a lot of 
screenwriting advice is you know you only get a you only get one chance to make that first impression were you a little nervous about showing him your first script it sounds like at this point you're already working on other scripts um, was there any hesitation hey man hold off let me finish this second or third or fourth script before I show it to Steven Spielberg not really and that might have been because I was so naive then um, but at the same time I was excited about uh, getting his feedback and I had confidence in the script you know it, it uh, it's probably not the best of my work in my uh, career as a screenwriter but it was a it was a it was a you know an honorable foray for a 21 year old mm -hmm. and kind of show what I wanted to do and he was kind enough to give me some suggestions some feedback and it led to a couple other opportunities of meeting new people um, you know they didn't buy it and the studio didn't buy it at the time the, the company didn't buy it but it kind of gave me the confidence to move forward and that was really something that was um, uh, a great blessing yeah yeah okay so here you are you're you're writing scripts you're networking and getting those scripts out there maybe you can talk about those first like professional you know that first break or those first professional credits um, how did you make that leap from just handing your script and getting advice to actually you know maybe getting an agent or whatever that first step was to actually making it into a career sure well the interesting thing is is that I, I didn't have enough time to write while I was working with Steven because of the long, days were so long so I quit my job to become a writer so I'd have more time and I quickly went broke and I found that I needed to keep making uh, some money to keep paying for my groceries and so I got a gig um, at Disney working in creative affairs um, in Hollywood at Hollywood Pictures and what was nice about that is uh, I had the opportunity then to work on the buying side of the screenwriting business. Well, on Steven's side is obviously a producer and creator and a selling side. And now I was working for all the guys that were reading the scripts and buying the scripts and deciding, um, you know, what writers they put on projects. So I learned that side of the business. And uh, at the same time, it allowed me a little bit more time each week to write. So I worked on a script there. And I got that one done. I shared it with my boss at the time, Mike Stinson, who then went on to um, great success uh, working with Bruckheimer. And, um, and he was uh, kind enough to pass it up the ladder there. And uh, the executives there passed it on to a few other folks. And I ended up getting it optioned by um, a small producer at the time. And I got an agent out of that. And then I teamed up with a buddy of mine, and he and I uh, wrote another script, uh, an action adventure, um, really for families, called uh, Little Outlaws. And we optioned up at Paramount, and that gave us an, enough money to um, uh, live for about six months. So we quit our day jobs. I was working at Disney. He was working for Wes Craven at the time. We both moved to the beach. We labeled ourselves screenwriters, and we started and then we quickly went broke again. And, uh, but we typed our ass off until we uh, got one gig and another gig and another gig, and then soon we were uh, paying our bills okay. Okay, and so this agent, once you had that agent, was he able to get you meetings and get you some of those first deals and, and projects? Yeah, uh, his name is Bayard Maybank, and um, he, at the time he was with Triad Artists, and then he went off and started his own business, and now of course, He's a uh, head of literary at uh, the Gersh Agency, and uh, he is incredibly good at his job, and he believed in us and what we were doing, and he helped us uh, get our work out to all producers and studios and start getting meetings, and then it really was up to us and our writing to try to uh, get the jobs. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about, on IMDb, Vampire in Brooklyn is your first um, produced credit. And let's talk about the interim, sort of getting that agent and starting to make a little bit of money and then actually getting a produced credit. Was there a lot of false starts where maybe you would option something, get paid to write something, but it didn't get produced? Maybe you can just talk about that. And I think it's a world that a lot of people that are going into screenwriting don't realize that you can be a screenwriter selling stuff, but you don't have any produced credits. So maybe just talk about that, how, how hard it was to get over that hump and actually get that produced credit um, and how many other projects were sort of in the mix. Absolutely. Uh, we were hired to write a number of different projects um, for different uh, small production companies or small independent studios um, before we got the call um, 
from Wes Craven's office to uh, to do Vampire. We we're also writing specs as well to try and generate new opportunities, of course. And maybe we'd option those. Maybe we might sell something. But you know, it wasn't ever uh, the big opportunity yet until we got the call, um, and. <clears throat> It was a wonderful thing. We were actually not doing great at the time, trying to figure out, you know, how we were going to, you know, uh, pay the rent, you know, in a couple months. And the phone rang and it was Wes Craven's office, who Chris had known from working um, in development with them um, a, a couple years prior. And they read our scripts and they liked us a lot. And they said, hey, do you guys have a pitch? Um, for this um, Eddie Murphy project that we're developing, which you'd be interested in, in giving us your take on it. We said, hell yeah, we would. So we went in uh, the next day, um, and uh, they had a script they were working on that needed a lot of work, and we kind of broke it down, put it back together, told them what it is that we would do with it. They said, great, we love what you're telling us. It's different from all the other writers we're hearing from, and we'd like you to pitch it to Paramount. So we did. They liked what we said, and they said, they wanted us to pitch it to Eddie. So we flew to New York and pitched it to Eddie, and he liked it, and we got hired. And we uh, worked uh, uh, on it for uh, about a month, month and a half, and uh, turned it around and got it greenlit for production. And that was our first break, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I'm curious, how did you transition then? So th it sounds like you were writing a lot of action scripts, certainly Vampire in Brooklyn being Eddie Murphy. It's not a kid friendly animation script. How did you then transition into all of these credits that you have doing animation projects? Very family so that was friendly never, animation projects. Sure. it's a. Uh, it was never um, a goal. It was never a plan. You know, I was always a uh, uh, enamored by, driven toward, attracted to action adventure fair. Um, and uh, Chris, my partner at the time, he and I wrote a love story set during the Revolutionary War that we had Matthew McConaughey attached to star in called The Traitor. And um, uh, we had some luck getting it aligned with good producers, good directors, uh, financing, and then at the last minute it fell through. But what happened was as a result of that script, um, suddenly people at DreamWorks um, uh, had re read it and called, a, called us and said, hey, we have an animated movie that has um, some of the same uh, American um, attitude and uh, thematic elements um, to it that you have in your script and we think you might be good for it. So we went and we met and we pitched um, Jeffrey Katzenberg and um, we got the gig uh, writing uh, Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron. And everybody thought we were great uh, for that. And it allowed me to <clears throat> um, kind of like exercise my uh, muscles of, um, of action and adventure fare in that world, but also have a lot of fun with imagination and creativity and character in ways that uh, animation affords you that live action may not always mm -hmm. and uh we had a blast doing it and then suddenly disney said hey if you're good enough for dreamworks you must be good enough for us and they asked us to come on and um help with the the sequel to milan and emperor's new groove and lilo and stitch and 101 dalmatians and home on the range so we kept uh typing and they kept liking what they were reading and so they kept calling us back and um it was a great little run while it lasted yeah yeah so i'm curious uh, on a couple it's it's kind of a two-part question um out of college very typical story you got out of college you moved to la um what's your take on living in los angeles and now you know as you've matured in your career you've moved back to atlanta and so maybe you can talk a little bit about you know do new screenwriters need to live in la um and and can you actually continue to have a, a vibrant screenwriting career if you're not in L.A.? Sure. Um, I think it's important to be in Los Angeles. Uh, obviously, you can type anywhere, but once you're finished with it, you need to get it out there in the world. And you, in order to do that, you need to get it into the hands of literary agents and managers, and they're all there. And even if your cousin in Poughkeepsie you know, knows a dentist who knows a doctor who knows somebody who works in an office at, you know, uh, at CAA, it's one person. It really behooves you to be there pounding the pavement to try and generate and cultivate 
those relationships. And if they like it and want to represent you and want to work with you and get you out there in the world, they need to be run, uh, you need to be able to run around and meet everybody at the studios or at the networks. And to do that effectively and efficiently, it helps to be there. And if they want to hire you, they want you in the room. And it makes sense. So um, I do think it is essential to be there or at least be able to spend a good quality of time there as you're building your career. Um, once I had a little wind under my sails, um, I did move back, uh, to Atlanta and, um, partially because I just like Atlanta. I like the South. I like the seasons. I like the culture. I like the music on the radio. Um, and I enjoyed my years in Los Angeles and I still have great friends there and manager and attorney and CPA there, which allows me to keep a little bit of, bit of a foothold and I go back and forth as needed. But frankly, it's not as easy for me to um, um, uh, work day to day in the industry um, as um, I was when I was there. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the reason that later on in my career, when I came back here, I started doing other things. Uh, directing, producing, commercial content, unscripted television, and certainly now I'm, I'm really enjoying lecturing at the university. Okay. And so I just want to touch on that just quickly on some of the TV stuff. There's a lot of TV writers um, that would listen to this podcast. And so maybe you can talk about that transition, um, you know, producing some television and how you made that transition um, and what your recommendations are just in terms from a writing perspective, how writers can potentially break into TV as well. Sure. Well, there's there's a couple different things uh, to it. One is um, if you want to be producing, uh, directing um, scripted television, it really behooves you to be in Los Angeles as well for that. I wanted to be in Atlanta, and so it made it harder for me to uh, transfer my skill set uh, from feature writing into scripted television. But what I did find back here was that all the unscripted networks – want you to find great characters in your backyard in cool, funky worlds that really are outside of L.A. and New York, where most writers, directors, producers live. So that they want you to find the next, um, you know, Duck Dynasty, basically. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's partially what helped drive that phase of my career when I got back here was – where are the barriers of entry lowest? How can I use my skill set to try and um, develop new opportunities here and uh, enjoy um, creating content? And it was a different shape than it had been in Los Angeles, but um, I was enjoying some of it. <laughs> Maybe not all of it. Yeah. Sure. So let's dig into your um, your new book, Crash, Boom, Bang. Uh, maybe you can just kind of pitch us, tell us what that's all about, and then um, we can dig into it a little bit. Sure. Um, it's my first book. I've never written a book before. I've been writing screen screenplays my whole life, and I've been teaching screenwriting uh, for a number of years now, not only in, uh, at, at Emory University and University of North Georgia, um, but also lecturing around and in my own workshops. And people have been telling me I should write a book, really, for a few years. Um, but uh, I was reluctant just because I hadn't done it before and I wasn't sure exactly um, my approach to it. But finally I acquiesced and I wrote uh, an introduction in a first chapter and I shared it with a couple buddies and they said, hey, this is great, you should send it to a publishing house. And I did and I was fortunate to find uh, Michael Weesey Productions, who's the largest uh, publisher of independent film and screenwriting books in the world. And uh, they really liked it, and they liked me, and they said, we think you got something here, and we did a deal, and uh, they sent me a check, and then I had to write the rest of the book. And so I uh, put together 12 chapters that's largely based on what I teach in the classroom and what I teach in the workshops, and it walks, um, you know, writers, professional writers, aspiring writers, wannabe writers, um, through all the nuts and bolts of taking your idea from concept, you know, to completion. And then ultimately it gives a little bit of sense of uh, how to prepare for you know, launching your screenplay out into the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, what do you think of other screenwriting books in general? Are there some that you like? Are there some that inspired you to kind of throw your hat in the ring? 
Uh, I when I first got to LA, I studied screenwriting a, a good bit. I studied, you know, all the great screenwriting um, lecturers there. I read books um, of a variety of folks um, who I really liked. I'm a fan of, of you know. Um, of uh, of Blake Snyder and Linda Seeger and John Truby and uh, Robert McKee and they've all been very helpful to me. But I will say honestly, the most inspirational and guiding voice in my screenwriting career was my screenwriting professor at Boston University. His uh, name is Dr. John Kelly, and I was with them, you know, two or three days a week, every week for a whole semester. And um, by the time I left there, I really feel like I had a good foundation to at least believe that I knew how to write and also had the, the confidence that hopefully I could succeed in, in, in doing it. Mm -hmm. So are there some specific maybe just um, tips, tricks to writing the action movie that you can share with us now? Just maybe just a little teaser of kind of what your book is, is going to help people with. Yeah, I think um, a, a few things. One is have something to say. You know, I think if, if we writers, whether we're writing, you know, romance, drama, comedy or action, uh, have a theme in mind, a message in mind, then at the core, you have something for your whole movie to stand upon. And it gives you cause to, you know, uh, face the blank page every day and and try to uh, finish it um, because you have something you want to say to the world. So if you never lose sight of that, it's great. Um, it gives you something uh, um, strong to stand on. Mm -hmm. So I say good, that. I say that I'm sorry. No, I say I that. What would be a good example? It sounds like that's what you're going to just go into. Oh yeah, it was like uh, with, with action movies. I think it's easy to like you know uh, start just feel as though that you can uh, survive on great action scenes and smart ass witty lines from you know handsome heroes and um, fast cars and you know big explosions, but um, having something to say underneath, I think really, really helps it all. So, I mean, I always go back to Die Hard, the, the original one, and, um, you know, Lethal Weapon, uh, even Raiders. I mean, a lot of the movies I grew up on are the ones that inspired me. And I think that those messages might be um, coming from uh, the world around us or social statements, but I think more often, times come from uh, character. And I think that when there's a lesson that your hero needs to learn and they do learn in time to achieve their goal and achieve what it is that they want, that that ultimately is the best route to your audience uh, uh, digesting um, uh, the message with any real clarity. Yeah, yeah. So perfect. Let's talk a little bit about um, Screenwriter School in Atlanta. Maybe you can kind of tell us what that's all about and how people could potentially, um, you know, learn more. Um, I started Screenwriter School uh, several years ago to accommodate the um, request by many people that I share what it is that I had learned um, uh, so that they can go off and, and write their stories with some sort of uh, – um, uh, discipline and, um, and, uh, it's been great. I just hold weekend workshops a few times a year is basically been the scope of it. And in, uh, one weekend on a Saturday and Sunday, I walk everybody through the nuts and bolts of taking the script from conflict to completion. So by the end of two eight hour days together, they really have, um, a good um, base to to start writing their scripts from, and then I am available to help them on a one on one basis with those screenplays um, downstream should should they wish. Okay, what are some common mistakes? Maybe you can just talk a little bit about you know you're doing these workshops, you're seeing a lot of new writers come in. Um, what are some common mistakes that um, that you see over and over again? You know, the biggest mistake I find from writers, not only in the workshops, but in the university setting, is the belief that it's too hard, that they can't do it, that the competition is too overwhelming. And I say, look at your Netflix queue and look on your television and look in, you know, um, you know, Fandango, look all around. There's more and more avenues of uh, and channels of distribution of entertainment 
now than there ever has been, and they continue to grow at an exponential rate thanks to, you know, the web. So um, there are opportunities out there. It may not be um, writing, um, you know, fast and furious for everyone, but there, those opportunities exist too. Someone needs to write those movies. Um, why can't they? So I think if they're able to get over that, and realize that if they do the work, they learn the craft, they apply what they've learned, and then have the confidence and conviction to get it out there in the world, that anything can happen. And I'm a firm believer that you can't control your own um, destiny. Uh, you need a little bit of help from the universe, but you can do your part. And then I think you have to have some confidence that the universe will do it. Yeah. So again, as someone who sees a lot of students, I'd be curious to get your take on the nature versus nurture argument. Um, are there some screenwriters that come in there and you just feel like, man, that guy doesn't have a lot of talent, but then six months down the road, they they send you a script that's, oh, that's actually pretty good. Um, wh where do you think the, the nature versus nurture argument kind of falls for screenwriting? I think that um, there is an inherent talent you can bring to the page but also that talent needs to be honed. It's like, you know, Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, you know, whoever that hits the court, hits the course, um, doesn't just automatically start playing at the top of their game because of their natural talent. That helps them prepare for a lifetime of learning the craft and practicing the crafts and mastering the craft. Mm -hmm. So I think that you can have some innate qualities and things that are taught to you in your youth that enable you to kind of tap into your creativity. But those are things that we talk about as well. Mm -hmm. um, some writers have exceptional skill and some don't, but I think everybody can learn and everybody can get better. And I think ultimately it will help uh, them become better screenwriters better writers of um, other mediums, um, and better people, understanding what makes um, stories work, and understanding what makes messages strong, and understanding what makes characters whole. Mm -hmm. So how can people find your book? Um, is it already been released? Um, and where would be a good place to go buy it if people wanted to check it out? It just came out uh, two weeks ago in Barnes & Noble uh, nationwide. Um, so they can go to any one of the, uh, those uh, shops and they should have it on the shelf or they can order it if they don't already have it. Uh, they can order it uh, via Amazon um, and probably um, pick it up at any other uh, mom pa bookstore or have them, mm -hmm. them order it. Okay. So uh, I'd, I'd love them. Um, I'd love everyone to, to take a look at it and hopefully that'll help them in their journey, whether they're action screenwriters, aspiring action screenwriters or writers of any other genre. Okay. And same thing for Screenwriter School. Um, how can people find out more about that when you're doing your next workshops? And They can go to, they can go to screenwriterschool.com to see more about it uh, and to register. They can email me at any time, uh, michael at screenwriterschool.com. And really the best thing that anybody can do to stay up to um, speed on what I'm doing and also get uh, tips on, on writing almost on a daily basis is uh, follow us on Facebook at Screenwriter School. Okay, perfect, perfect. I will round all that stuff up and, and put it in the show notes just so people can click over to it. So, Michael, fascinating interview. I really appreciate your coming on and talking with me today. Sure, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. We'll talk to you later. All right, take care. You too. Bye. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and then you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors. Concept, 
characters, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write a logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline synopsis service to an analysis or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, you get a free email and fax blast to my list of industry contacts. This is the exact same blast service I use myself to promote my own scripts, and it's the same service I sell on the website. It's a great way to get your script into the hands of producers who are looking for material. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com com slash consultants again that's selling your screenplay.com slash consultants on the next episode of the podcast I'm going to be interviewing writer director Jared Cohen he's done a number of horror thriller films and we talk about one of his most recent films a film called Devil's Domain it's a fascinating inspirational story that he's going to tell about how he broke into the business. Jared's very down to earth. We talk through his exact process of how he got his career going. Just to give you some perspective, he's directed 15 films in the last three years. So he's very busy. He's constantly working. I've talked with the writers on two of these films. Sort of coincidentally, Jared has directed two of the films with, of, of films that I've interviewed the writers on this podcast. Those two films are called The Horde. That was episode number 129. You can go Go take a look at that and also a film called Little Dead Riding Hood which was episode number 113 Jared has lots of great advice for all of this so I think it's a very, as I said very inspirational and um, just encouraging interview lots of little tidbits um, lots of great advice so keep an eye out for that episode next week to wrap things up, I just want to touch on a few things from today's interview with Michael. I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to go ahead and mention it again. A while back, I did an analysis of the first 75 podcast episodes. I basically went through and charted how each one of those screenwriters broke into the business. I'm going to link to that article in the show notes so you can have a look at it. It's pretty broad, and as I said, it really breaks down different paths of breaking into the business. By far, the single biggest way that people broke into the business as a screenwriter was a story like what Michael just told. Getting a job in the business, writing scripts in your spare time, and then having some building relationships through that job so that you have people to give your scripts to once you're finished with them. I will link again, I will link to this article in the show notes, but really do keep this in mind. If you are in a position to move to LA and take a low level job in the industry, that this really is going to be your best bet at breaking into the business as a screenwriter. Again, it's not the only way. Check out the article. It's It breaks down all the different other ways that people broke in. So this isn't the only way to break in, but just far and away, this was the number one way people broke into the business. It's a, they, they all had stories very, very similar to Michael's. Getting that low-level job, meeting people, writing scripts, and then getting some of those people that you meet in the industry to read the scripts. The other thing I really want to highlight from Michael's story is how he got Steven Spielberg to read the script. You know, he wasn't being annoying or weird. He wasn't going up to people and asking them to read the script. He was just doing his thing. He was writing scripts in his spare time, talking about them, entering them into contests, doing the normal stuff. And just through normal conversation, people were in the office were aware that he was writing a script. And by not being that annoying person that's just trying to push it on people, it actually has the opposite effect. If you're just working away on your scripts, people know you're working away on the scripts. Some of the people in the office are just going to be you know, naturally curious, wonder what it's like. I wonder if it's any good. I wonder what it's about. And so they're going to approach you and they're going to ask you to read those scripts. So again, I would say this is not only a great sort of a macro view, you know, that idea of getting a job in the industry, meeting people and working their way up. I think Michael offered a real firsthand glimpse at exactly what that means what you do when you get that job you get in there you network with people you don't you're not the annoying person hey man you want to read my script that's not what you're gonna do you're gonna get in there you're gonna do a good job at whatever your designated position is but you're also gonna be working on the weekends at nights you're gonna be writing your scripts and just throughout the conversations natural conversations you can bring this up you can tell people oh yeah I'm working on this script or I'm working on that script and again word will get word will get out and people will start to ask um, what you're working on 
And especially if you couple it with something like entering it into contests and actually winning some of these contests, you know, word will get out. Oh, Michael, he won this contest, you know, and that will just pique people's interest more and get people more interested in, in perhaps reading your material. So again, I think this is an excellent template for anybody who is in a position to, um, to just move to LA, find that low level job in the business and try working their way up. Um, this is exactly how it's done. And as I said, just, I would guess if you analyze, you know, how screenwriters broke in across not just the 75 episodes, my guess is it would hold true no matter how many screenwriters, um, how big your pool of screenwriters was. My guess is Michael's story is going to be probably one of the more common ones that you hear. Anyway, that's the show. Thank you for listening.